Okay, it's one minute after one and we will get started. Um, hello everybody. Welcome to the Michigan Historic Preservation Network webinar series. My name is Xiaohan Bao Smith. I'm the Historic Property of MHPN, Properties Coordinator of MHPN. And we are very excited today to have our speaker, Cassandra Talley, um, with Kramer Design Group to talk about In the Writing Mode, Harold Turner in Michigan. Before we get started, I would like to go over some Zoom items. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box as you think of them, and all the questions will be answered at the end. Please use the chat box to share your thoughts and resources. Both the Q&A and chat boxes are located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you don't see them, please wiggle your mouse. And um, after the webinar concludes, you will receive an email with a recording link and a survey link. Please participate in the survey to help us improve our webinar. If this is your first time attending our webinar, we are the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We advocate for Michigan's historic places to contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We could not do the work we do without our members and volunteers. So if you're not a member yet, please consider joining us at www.mhpn.org. This webinar is supported in part by an award from the Michigan Arts and Culture Council. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Cassandra Talley. Um, Cassandra holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in the history of art from University of Michigan and a Juris Doctor degree from Michigan State University and a Master of Science in Historic Preservation from Eastern Michigan University. Cassandra joined Primer Design Group in 2018 after six years practicing law in and around Detroit. At the Kramer Design Group, Cassandra primarily works on historic tax credit projects, national register nominations, and historic resource surveys. With that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Cassandra. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? All right. Um, hello, as um, Shohan said, my name is Cassandra Talley, and um, I'm glad you all are participating. Um, this presentation is an outworking of a final project I did for my master's degree at Eastern Michigan University in historic preservation. Um, and I perform, performed an intensive thematic survey of all Harold Turner designed houses in Michigan. Um, the research and the basic outline of this project was conceived in the fall of 2020, um, whereas the actual survey work in the field and writing the survey report was conducted from January to April of 2021. All right, so what is an intensive historic survey? Um, a historic survey is generally commissioned by a local government. Um, and it's a planning tool that you, communities use to take stock of their um, historic resources. And it's used as a basis for sound planning. Um, it's, uh, it's, it helps communities understand you know, what resources they have and to better understand the history of those resources. It's intensive because each property was researched beyond that which you can see from you know, a windshield survey. Um, and it's thematic because it was bounded by theme as opposed to a specific location. Um, some cities might do a survey of their downtown or of a, of a specific neighborhood. Um, this particular survey was kind of all over Michigan because the houses are located all over Michigan. Um, a survey has three primary component, components, research, fieldwork, and writing the survey report. Um, the complete survey report that I produced for this project is actually currently being hosted online by the Bloomfield Historical Society, and um, it's easy to find if you just Google Bloomfield Historical Society and Harold Turner. Um, 
Before we launch into the history as a general aside, I just wanted to let people know that there are no secondary resources on Harold Turner, um, nor is there a collection of his drawings or um, papers in any archive. Um, Harold Turner's daughter was a vital resource to me as I conducted this survey, but even her document, documentation is fragmentary. So um, the information that I compiled in the survey report and that I'm presenting here is, um, I think, the most comprehensive compilation of information about his life, but it's also not complete. Um, and in, if you read the survey report, there's um, caveats at places where I couldn't find some of the information. So there were four survey areas. Um, the houses are located in four municipalities in Michigan, in Bluefield Township, Grand Blanc, Southfield, and Alto, Michigan. The slide show, um, the slide, this slide shows a 1974 aerial photo um, of uh, um, the large cluster of homes in Bloomfield Township on Oberlea. And then I have a series of maps we can just run through really quickly to situate ourselves. Um, this is a map of all the properties in Bloomfield Township. Um, there were 14 houses in Bloomfield uh, that were designed and built by Harold Turner, while two additional properties were identified as potentially uh, designed by Turner. Uh, you'll note that I've uh, highlighted the Affleck house here, which was a, a Frank Lloyd Wright designed house that Harold Turner built, as well as the, uh, the Birmingham Bloomfield Art Center here, which Harold, Harold Turner designed the interior of that building in the 1960s. Uh, Grand Blank. Uh, there are three Turner designed houses in Grand Blank, all situated on Meadowwood Lane, which you can see here. Um, there might be more in Grand Blank, but um, these were the only three I was actually able to identify, conclusively anyway. Um, Southfield, there's one house on Briar Bank Court, shown here, which is um, right next to Lasser Road here. And one house in Alto, Michigan on Valhalla Drive, uh, located directly adjacent to the Thorn Apple River. This is um, one of Turner's earliest designs here. All right, so who was Harold Turner? Um, when I first embarked on this project, I read through several books on Frank Lloyd Wright to see what I could find about him um, in Wright scholarship. About the only thing I was able to find in, in the books I read was that he was itinerant and a perfectionist. And um, that was about it. And I think as you go through, you'll probably agree that both of those labels um, may be justified. Uh, he was born in August 6 in 1892 in Copenhagen, Copenhagen Denmark. And his father was uh, a maskin medker, which roughly translates to a carpenter who uses tools. Uh, it's not clear if he attended college. One census record indicated he had two years of college, one said four. I couldn't confirm any of it. Um, so it seems likely to me that he learned the building trait from his father. Uh, Turner immigrated to New York in 1914 aboard the Frederick VIII ship, which is shown at the upper right, and he listed Joyner on his immigration arrival card, which you can see over on the lower right. And he settled in uh, Troy, New York, which is in upstate New York. Uh, Turner's wife and young daughter joined him in Troy in late 1914. Um, Troy had a large Danish population centered in the Lansingburg district just north of Troy, and um, uh, the 1915 New York census and his 1917 uh, World War I draft registration card uh, both report, reported his profession as a carpenter. And the draft card is down here. And this is um, a shot of Lansingburg, Fifth Avenue. Uh, that's the street he lived on. And there's a photo of it there. So um, details on his life in New York are not abundant, but um, I do know that he was employed uh, at the firm Souter and Ritchie, who were responsible for um, building many prominent churches in the area, including the Westminster Presbyterian Church and the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. Um, and Agner Larson was a, the longtime superintendent of Souter and Ritchie, um, and I found his obituary. And I don't know if Turner had, um, you know, a connection to Agner or someone else in the area, or if he was attracted to Troy because of the large Danish population, not entirely sure. Um, Turner and his family next moved to North, 
Norfolk, Virginia, and um, shortly thereafter, then Washington, DC. Um, the 1920 census records him in Norfolk. Um, and it recorded his profession as a superintendent contractor in the manufacturing and uh, mechanical industries. In doing additional research on the history of Norfolk in the 1920s, it seems likely that Turner was involved in the naval shipyards there. Um, and I do know that he did naval contracting work sometime before 1937. So I believe that's what he might have been doing in uh, Norfolk. He naturalized in uh, Washington, DC in 1921. And he also listed DC as um, his address on several documents that I found from the early 20s. I know he bought a piece of property in uh, Washington, DC and the Craftsman House you see on the upper right is located on that property. I wasn't able to confirm if he himself built the house though. Um, and if he was doing naval contracting work, it would also explain his next move, uh, which was to back and forth to Hawaii. Um, so I found many ship manifests, about three or four of him shuttling back and forth to Honolulu in 1924 and 1925. Um, Harold's daughter remembers him saying that he helped dredge Pearl Harbor. And this photo on the upper right is from her collection. It's rather grainy and the, um, the, in, the, the inscription on the back was illogical, but I believe it shows his crew or the, the dredge he was working on. And there's also a photo of Pearl Harbor in the 20s at the bottom and just a dredge from sort of the same era, 1911. So by 1931, Turner was firmly settled in San Jose, California, having married an art professor from San Jose State University. Um, he founded his own contracting firm with uh, partner Alfred Vindelov, and he was busy at this time period uh, building houses around San Jose including building one for a Stanford University professor named Daniel Mendelowitz. It was sometime in 1936 when Mendelowitz recommended Turner to another Stanford professor, Paul Hanna, as Hanna was looking for a builder. Hanna had hired Frank Lloyd Wright to design a home for his family on a hill above Stanford's campus, um, but a builder that was willing and able to carry out the plans for that home was elusive. Um, Hanna and Wright both interviewed Turner and Turner spent some weeks in Taliesin before Turner was hired for the job. Finding a builder was difficult, as you can see from this slide here. This is the Hannah House in Stanford. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1936 and built by Harold Turner. And construction began in 1937, January of 1937. Um, this is the first built design by Wright that was a um, plan that was designed around a non-rectilinear grid. As you can see from the plan, it was organized um, on a hexagonal grid. As you can imagine, this was a very complicated house to construct. But from the very beginning, Turner showed ingenuity and a thorough knowledge of building that sometimes propelled him to deviate from Wright's plans. For instance, um, Turner strengthened the map foundation above the specifications stipulated by Wright by increasing the depth of the gravel bed and by reinforcing the concrete with um, reinforcing bars and wire mesh. Um, Wright had not specified the depth of the gra gravel bed, nor had he um, specified the reinforcement bars. And Turner also incorporated additional reinforcement bars into the retaining walls and into the central chimney stack. Um, and these additional reinforcements may have been critical in keeping the house standing during uh, the 1989 earthquake with, that happened in this area, which heavily damaged the house. Um, the fact that Turner had such a varied background with expertise in construction and joinery and engineering um, is one of the reasons he was so successful at building these incredibly complex Usonians like the Hannah House. Um, Turner spent the next six years on the road building houses for Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, the Gotech Winkler House shown here was constructed in 1940 in Okemos, Michigan. And um, this house and the uh, documents that I was able to find also illustrate Turner's willingness to alter uh, Wright's ill-conceived or faulty design ideas. Um, Wright had proposed installing a slatted wooden floor in the kitchen of this house, but um, so that dirt could be swept down into the slats, uh, but fearing a broken ankle or a broken high heel, uh, Turner altered the design and this quote that I'm showing here is from a letter from Wright to Turner that shows his anger at the alteration. Um, 
And Turner and Wright also exchanged like somewhat acrimonious letters on um, the next house he was building, which is the Red Hewn House in New York, um, which was done in 1938. Um, Turner was such an experienced builder at this point, and he had his own ideas on how to design and complete these buildings. And friction was apparent almost immediately in the correspondence I was able to find. Although it's also clear in the correspondence that they had great respect for each other's talents. Um, despite these issues, Turner continued working with Wright into the early 1940s. Um, he built some of Wright's largest and most complex Usonians, including the Armstrong House, shown here, which is in Ogden Dunes, Indiana, which was constructed from 1939 to 1940, the Affleck House in Bloomfield Hills, and the Wall House in Plymouth, Michigan. So the two on the right, he was working on simultaneously here in Michigan. It was during the construction of the Affleck House in Bloomfield Hills that um, Harold Turner met the woman who would become his third wife, Laura, when he would drive from the build site in Bloomfield Hills uh, down, the seat, down the street to the Devon Gables restaurant, um, which was located at Telegraph and Long Lake. Um, Laura owned this restaurant, um, and after their marriage, Turner would go on to uh, design additions and the interior spaces for the restaurant, some of which you can see here. Uh, these are all undated, but I believe they're from the late 50s or uh, early 1960s. Devon Gables was a fixture in Bloomfield Hills for over 50 years um, before being demolished sometime before 1980. So before we begin discussing Turner's houses, I think it's important to understand the philosophy that underpins organic architecture. Um, the term organic architecture was coined by Frank Lloyd Wright, but his rather uh, cryptic communication style uh, makes it difficult to pin down his own definition. However, it's generally understood to mean that uh, a building should be designed in a way that seeks to unify space, both interior and exterior, and that each building should be specifically tailored to its own site. Um, further utilizing um, unadulterated material, natural materials is often seen as a pillar of organic architecture. And Wright wanted organic architecture to be seen as a source of inspiration for other architects. So although he may be viewed as the progenitor of this style, he was by no means its only practitioner. A few key principles. Um, the site should enhance the building and the building should enhance the site. The site dictates the form of the building, which you can see here in these photos. And uh, materials are not disguised. Usonian architecture. So this was uh, Wright's term to, um, or his solution, I guess I could say, um, to house the general populace while still embracing the principles of um, organic architecture. So it's sort of the organic architecture for the everyman, I guess you could say. Um, but while, for, like, while Wright espoused this philosophy um, rooted in designing buildings that were in harmony with nature and with man, he often rigidly stamped his buildings with his own notions of space planning and how the house should be used. Um, he designed furniture and fixtures and his tales of his obsessive vision are commonplace. There's one story that he came to a house party thrown by a woman who owned one of his houses and he was aghast to see that the furniture in the dining room um, had been moved from his original arrangement. So he promptly like dragged the furniture back to where he had originally specified it as the hostess watched. And I mean, installing built-in couches and shelves and other items as Wright often did, seemed to like preempt this, you know, this usurpation of his vision. I mean, after all, nothing stops an enterprising housewife from moving the furniture if it's built into the structure itself. So Turner, on the other hand, um, he, was a, he was a devotee of organic architecture. And he also built with natural materials and extensive use of glass and he, these large unified living spaces. But while Turner was working in the Wrightian mold, he removed much of the ego from the design calculus. Um, unlike Wright, uh, substantial built-in furniture isn't a common feature in Turner's designs, although there are some breakfast bars and built-in drawers and you know cabinets. Um, and in this sense, I posit in the, in the survey report, um, Turner's designs are perhaps a better expression of unity between man and nature and space, given that the space is uh, not predetermined with permanent furniture. 
Turner clients, you know, can genuinely use their space in different ways at different times, depending on their own needs and their own desires, furniture moves included. There's a much more client-centric fluidity of space in Turner Designs than rights, I think. And on a metaphysical level, um, you know, it imbues the space with a lighter, less heavy-handed feel. And these are photos here are all um, Turner designed houses. This one up here is on Lone Pine. This one over here is on Clarendon. This one here is on Overlea Lane. And this one is the little cottage on the Thornapple River outside of uh, Grand Rapids. Okay, so let me get into the actual houses that he designed. The first house he designed was the Turner Family Home on Telegraph in Bluefield Hills. Um, I couldn't get close to this house. It's that's really far back from the road. So um, uh, Harold Turner's daughter provided some historic photos for me that the black and white ones you see here, and I have an aerial clip here. Um, the tax rolls indicate that this home uh, likely they, he started construction, we think, in 1944 based on the assessments and the tax rolls. Um, it's situated on Gilbert Lake. And as you can see, it's kind of got this rectilinear, rectangular design, and it's heavily influenced by his years with Wright, based on what I could determine. Um, Harold Turner's daughter remembered, and this is a quote from her, we grew up with stained concrete floors warmed by radiant heat. There were huge, four huge fireplaces centered in the house above and below each other to warm from the inside out. Many roofs were cantilevered and did not need supports by posts and walls and roofs were often slanted for a purpose, either to help the wall not shift as it was built into a hill or to help shed the rain and the snow. This was the largest home that um, I discovered during the survey. Um, another early home that Turner designed was the Thornapple Cottage um, in Alto, Michigan, shown here in some historic photographs. Um, this house was also set really far back from the road and getting good photos of it was uh, essentially impossible. Uh, I wrote letters to all the homeowners and I got some really great uh, responses, but other, other folks I think were just busy and didn't get back to me. So this was built in um, 1947. And there's a quote up there from the home homeowner, Edna Hartbury. Hmm. Now settled in Bluefield Hills permanently, Turner uh, started his own design firm called Organic Homes in the late 1940s. Um, and he began designing custom homes for folks in the area. And during the same period, uh, Laura, Laura and Harold began subdividing part of the land that they owned on Gilbert Lake. You can see the plat map here, um, the lots situated here with the notations from, I believe the assessor at the time showing which houses had been built. Um, two of the earliest homes in Devon on the Lake subdivision are shown here, 5490 Shadow Lane and 5495. Turner was on, um, because Turner was heavy, heavily involved in the build process and was on site daily during construction, creating his own plant um, sub subdivision in this area makes sense as it likely um, gave him greater control over the build as things were progressing. Um, next, Turner designed the Mullenix family home on Mystic Valley, which is shown here at the lower right. Um, this one was also designed with a rectilinear plan. Um, and in 1951, he designed a hexagonal home at 4040 Overly at Court, which is shown here and here. A few additional homes he designed in the early to mid 1950s are shown here. Um, the house on the right is 3791 West Pemberton. Um, this one, this house is a bit stylistically difficult to place in his otherwise pretty cohesive design repertoire. It is essentially an L-shaped uh, ranch and um, it doesn't quite fit with, you know, all the other houses that you'll see in these slides, but um, the um, descendants of the original owner did confirm that it, it's a Harold Turner design. The drawing snippet that I have, there's no stamp and it's, it's fairly blurry, so it's hard to read. Um, but the current owner did say that he had heard that Turner designed some normal houses. And so this is what I believe is an example of one of the more traditional homes. 
I have a suspicion that there are other more normal houses that he designed that we just don't know about because unless that oral history is passed on, those houses without being able to identify them but based on you know these really distinct features we see in the other ones, it would they're probably they lost to time. Uh, this house over here is 5530 Shadow Lane. And this was one of the houses I had the hardest time finding information about. Don't know much about it. Okay, so the peak years. Um, the bulk of Turner's output uh, was designed and constructed from 1956 to 1958. He had a really remarkably small window of time to you know, create these houses because he was already by this point getting into his 60s. Um, these three houses are the um, houses located in Grand Blanc next to each other on Meadowood Lane. Um, more houses from his peak period. These are, um, let's see, this is 4050. The, the top two photos are 4050 over Leah Lane. The bottom right photo is the house on Lone Pine. And the bottom left photo is um, the house on Club Drive. These are all in Bloomfield Township. Okay. Um, just a few weeks ago, the son of the original owner of the house on Clarendon got a hold of me because he had found the survey report online. And I was so excited because he had slides of the construction of the house, which he very generously shared with me. And there's a couple here up at the top. Um, it was built in 1956. And the bottom slides are actually um, Harold Turner's in the plaid shirt. And the man with the uh, white colored shirt is apprentice architect, John Simonson. So these are just great copies. And this is the house in Southfield. Um, the current owner was also very, all the owners that got back to me were just amazing. And I got to tour some of them and I got photos of some of them, including these photos of the house in Southfield. Um, this was also um, done during his peak period of, from 1956 to 1958. I think this one is actually 1958. And the last two that he designed, this one is on Lockridge in Bloomfield, or Bloomfield Township. Um, and the other one he designed in the 60s was at 4045 Overly Court, but I don't have photos of that one. So I'm just showing the one on Lockridge here, which is a really substantial large one. So later in life, um, Harold Turner was mostly retired by 1960 and he took up painting and sculpture. Um, in addition to teaching sculpture at the Birmingham Bloomfield Art Center, he also redesigned the interior of their building, which I had mentioned up at the top when we were looking at the maps. Um, they had acquired an old um, wastewater treatment building, I believe, and in 1960, and Harold Turner uh, supposedly redid the interior of the building. It was closed. Um, I conducted the survey during COVID and the building was closed, so I wasn't able to access it. I don't know if any of the interior of that building uh, from 1960, like what it remains. Um, Harold and Laura sold Devin Gables in 1967, and he later, uh, Harold Turner later died in 1974, followed by Laura in 1981. And the family house on Telegraph was, uh, was sold shortly thereafter, I believe. Um, okay, so early characteristics of Turner's work. Um, in reviewing the entire body of his work, we can make some characterizations of his earlier stuff and his later um, stuff. And um, these early, several of his earlier ones are in this rectilinear um, fashion, and they bear a lot of resemblance to Frank Lloyd Wright's inline designs, that is his designs built in uh, like a rectilinear uh, grid. They have flat roofs, horizontal lines, and they are comprised of rectangular shapes. Uh, this right here is the Turner family home on Telegraph. You can see this general rectilinear fashion, and this one here is on Mystic Valley. This portion right here and this portion right here, I believe, are additions. The original portion is this, I believe. And they are similar to the, like I said, the right designed um, Gotech Winkler house, which we saw earlier, the Christie house, 
and the Affleck House, shown here, um, all three of which Turner built. So uh, Harold Turner's um, peak years and his mature like style are these hexagonal houses. I like this picture here on the right because you can see the rectilinear Harold Turner house here, contrasted with the slightly later um, uh, hexagonal phase houses, which are essentially a series of overlapping hexagons. Um, although some of his hexagonal phase houses also have like more pointy bits as well. That, oh, that, that's a technical term, pointy bits. <laughs> uh, these houses over here are also on this hexagonal frame. Uh, this one up here is on West Pemberton. There's two on West Pemberton. Um, the one that didn't fit into his repertoire and this one up here that I'm showing. And this one here is on Lone Pine. So hallmarks of uh, Harold Turner's style. Um, pecky cypress or regular cypress is common. Um, radiant, heat, um, radiant heated slated floors are um, very typical, but there is also some examples of acrylic tile, carpet, and concrete being used. Um, a prow-shaped primary facade was common. Um, angled and slant roofs were um, seen in a lot of the houses, um, especially um, the prow-shaped facades or the large walls of glass are generally oriented to the best view of the lot. Um, carports are nearly ubiquitous. All of these houses had carports. Clear story windows were common. And uh, indoor planters are heavily featured in all of these houses, as are rubber trees. I think there was at least two of the houses that had rubber trees. Incidentally, um, this is also, this harkens back to Frank Lloyd Wright as well, um, these indoor planters and plants. Um, Turner was concerned with a lack of uh, humidity in modern homes, and he asked that homeowners plant rubber trees in their indoor planters. And when I was talking with the current owner of 4045 over Leah Court, she said that her mother had, uh, you know, heeding Turner's advice, had gone out and gotten a rubber tree and planted it in 1965. And today it's still in the house uh, thriving, which I think is just great. Uh, floor to ceiling windows and continuous flooring material that runs from the inside of the space to the outside, as you can see on this photo at the bottom of the Clarendon house. Um, that, those are also a common feature as are greenhouses. There's at least two with green, uh, three, three of these houses have greenhouses. So um, Turner left a legacy of finely designed and built houses in Michigan. And although they are few in number, they are excellent local examples of organic contemporary architecture. And they're highly sought after in Southeast Michigan. With little more than a decade to craft his own architectural legacy, um, Turner produced a body of work that encapsulated Wright's organic architecture um, philosophy while still carving out his own distinct style. Um, Turner's designs are all at once flexible and open while still providing distinct spaces for household tasks with none of the rigidity that you find in Wright houses, I would argue. Um, Turner dispensed with uh, copious built-ins and he pushed you know, jettison, he, he jettisoned these like low ceilings that you find in right houses and by pushing up the roofs to allow um, for these large windows. And it, I would say, like, creates space for the imagination and room for the soul. Um, in 1936, before Turner was officially hired to build the Hannah House, he wrote a letter to Paul Hannah expressing his excitement uh, for the project. In his own words, although they're, they in this instance were being applied to um, a right design, they presaged the design work that he would do on his own. He said, I feel that is, it is more than a mere house or shelter. It expresses personality in every detail, and may I call it a possession for your soul as well as for your physical well-being. And that is it. Any questions or comments? Thank you. It was great. Yeah, I was. I have not um, actually heard of this name or were aware of any design by him before. But it's great to learn. Um, are any of those houses like open, like or any chance open to the public for touring? No, no, no they're all no, they're all privately owned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're really spectacular, but um, a lot of them are, you know, in pretty yeah. 
like established residential neighborhoods and stuff. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Maybe let's see if there were will be more questions coming in. Um, okay. I think there may be. Um, let me see. Yes, so I see a question from yeah. Uh, I see. yeah, I can read the ones. Um, okay, and just read the question. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. Do you know of other contractors who were similarly influenced by right? Yeah, so in one section of the survey report, if you want to want some more information, there is a section where I compare and contrast some of the other um, contractors who worked with Wright and who later went on to design their own, you know, do their own design build firms. Um, Alden Dow is one of them. He's very well known. He worked out of Midland and produced a lot of really stunning architecture up there. Um, there's another man in New York, uh, Hankin is his last name. I think it's David Hankin. Um, he uh, worked with Wright. He also, like Turner, was not a trained architect, and he later went on to produce a bunch of houses in upstate New York. Um, and there's uh, several others. There's uh, this whole um, contingent of students or um, builders who worked with uh, Harold, or who worked with Wright, who later went on to build and design their own uh, their own structures. So. Oh. So somebody mentioned that um, she thinks um, the LTU still owns the yeah. Affleck House. Yep, the Affleck House is open, um, open for tours, I think, um, here and there. I don't think it's open like every day, but you can contact LTU, I think, to get a tour. Um, that's a, a right designed house, but Harold Turner did build it. So if you wanted to get a sense of um, some of some of the, you know, organic architecture, you could tour the, the Affleck house. Oh, perfect. Hannah House is open twice a year. Thank you. I don't know. Are there any other questions? I, if if um, anybody has a, any questions after the webinar, I think um, feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, I you you can email MHPN and um, we will um, connect you with Cassandra. <laughs> yeah, I see I see quite a few people on here who were who were really helpful to me during this um, survey. So I just want to give another thank you because uh, there were so many people who helped me out when I was doing this project and was much appreciated so thank you well thank you so much um so this um webinar is recorded and um you will receive the link to the recording um about probably tomorrow and um please participate in the survey um to help us um improve our webinars and um our next webinar is scheduled for May 26th, and we will have um, the founder and president of Friends of Four Stars Theater, um, also the MHPN vice president, board vice president, Marcus, um, to talk about aligning the stars, bringing back a historic theater in a troubled neighborhood. Um, this theater is in Grand Rapids. And um, I hope to see you all next time. Well, thank you again, Cassandra, for your time. Thank you. And, um, thank you wonderful information and thank you everybody for, for participating and um, hope you all have a great day.